like you to take your Bibles this evening, if you would, and turn to the 118th Psalm, Psalm 118. Must be a day for preaching textually or topically, I guess, but uh, that's what I did this morning in the message, and uh, I'll be doing much the same here tonight. In Psalm 118, uh, we'll read the first nine verses, but there's just one verse that I want to use as a text for this evening's message. Beginning in verse number one of Psalm 118, the Bible says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore I shall see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And that last verse is the verse of scripture that I want to uh, focus our attention on this evening. There's a popular belief that there are 31,175 verses in the Bible. And by the Bible, of course, I mean the pure word of God, the authorized King James Version. I haven't counted every verse in the Bible. Others have done that. But if there is 31,175 verses in the Bible, then the central verse is Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. There are 14 words in that verse, 7 plus 7, and the two middle words of that verse are the Lord. And certainly he is central in the Bible. However, it seems that others have a different count on the number of words, and a lot of that has to do with whether the, uh, the superscriptions in the Psalms where it says a psalm of David and gives the musical instrument or instruction, whether that counts as a verse or if it's not. And uh, the other account would place the two central verses at Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, which would also be interesting because that says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And uh, however you count the number of verses in the Bible, if you have trouble sleeping. Um, whatever number you might come up with, either one of those two central verses in the Bible point us to our God and our Lord. But it really doesn't matter. Uh, my text for tonight's message is Psalm 118, verse number 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in, the man, in man. And tonight I want to begin a, a short series on the subject of voting biblically. Voting biblically. And uh, you may be aware that we have a major election coming up on November the 3rd. And if you are a US citizen, 18 years of age and above, uh, you have a right to vote. You have the privilege to vote. In fact, you have a responsibility, I think a duty to vote. I'm thankful that we live in a country that is not like some of the countries we've been praying about. Uh, you're probably aware we've prayed much for the country of Belarus, which had elections just a few weeks ago. And the will of the people was made very clear. It wasn't close. But the president for life, it seems, has uh, suppressed the opposition in many different ways. And it is not a free country. And I'm thankful that we live in a free country. We're not like Iran or some of the Islamic republics and so forth. And so I want to focus our attention on not just voting. I think if you're a citizen, you should be voting. It's, not, it's irresponsible, in my opinion, to say, well, I just couldn't care about it. If you're of age and you have that uh, privilege, then certainly you should vote. Now, let me say at the beginning that I am prohibited by the Johnson Amendment to tell you who to vote for. Uh, it's uh, illegal. It could jeopardize our 501c status as a church if we take sides with any particular uh, political candidate. 
the Johnson Amendment is a provision in the US tax code prohibiting nonprofit organizations from endorsing or opposing political candidates. I think it's a bad law because it prohibits freedom of speech and certainly, at least on one side or the other, it has been flouted. Some churches will have only certain kinds of politicians with a certain view uh, preach and it's quite obvious whose side they're on and who they're promoting. But I am pro prohibited from telling you, and I, I think that it would be rather demeaning in a sense for me to tell you who to vote for. We are all intelligent adults and I think we are quite capable of doing that. But let me say also that I am not prohibited by the Johnson Amendment to tell you what to vote for. And I intend to do that. Not to tell you, but to guide you, to give you some guidance on biblical principles because I think that is very, very important. To guide us as Bible-believing Christians, not just to go and vote because it's the right thing to do and, and we may have a party preference that we've always voted this way, but I think as Christians we have a responsibility to think about those that would be elected into office, how do they line up with the word of God. And the only way you can really do that is to read the party platforms and compare what the party platforms say with what the word of God says. As Christians, this is our platform, right? It ought to be. And uh, the other platforms that man proposes, uh, we can uh, judge from them how close or how far they are from the word of God. But it's important to know what the political parties stand for because the candidates are obligated to follow their party's platform. They may tell you something else, they may make promises, they may tell you what they think you want to hear from them, but when it comes right down to it, they have to follow, uh, they're obligated to follow the platform that is put forth by their party. And so, that's what I'd like to do as we go through this series is to look at some of the key issues in the party platforms and then look at the Word of God and help you in making a reason and a biblical decision. I also understand that in this election we're not electing a pastor. Uh, I think it's important to mention that. If we were to elect a pastor for this church we would have very stringent qualifications. Number one, he better be a saved man. Number two, he better be a Bible-believing man. Number three, he better be a Baptist, amen? And uh, we could go on down the list, and we have, uh, and the Bible gives us many qualifications for a pastor, and he must be a spirit-filled, a godly man who can be an example to the flock, who is trained and skilled to be able to lead in the word of God. When we come to politicians, uh, we're not electing pastors, which is um, something that we need to keep in mind because politicians... Uh, do tend to have flaws. Uh, certainly nothing is perfect in our political system. But if we cast a vote, it should be a vote that would line up the platform that those who we would elect would follow and compared to the word of God. And then pray a whole lot. Amen. Pray that God would move upon the hearts of men. And God can do that. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 21 and verse number one, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of waters, he turneth it whithersoever he will. And I personally believe that we should be praying for God to be merciful to our country and not to give us the rulers that we probably deserve. But if you're a political junkie, meaning that you spend a lot of time following the news, and I know some of you say, I just turn it off, I can't handle that. And any time election season comes around, it's not always the most interesting time or the most enjoyable time. But if you are a political junkie to any degree, you probably realize that right now our country is divided. And uh, in general terms, we can boil down the division into two uh, trains of thought. There, is, tho there, there is, is those who are traditional and conservative, meaning they want to conserve what we've had over the years, the historical values that uh, brought this country up. And then there is the other party, which would be uh, described as being progressive, seeking to make changes either by political and it seems in some cases by radical means today. And enough said about that, but that same division that we have in our country is seen here in the text. 
It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And there you have really two opposing worldviews, which is at the heart of what people are doing and why they are saying things and, and, and it really is at the heart of how we vote for candidates and for these uh, p different political parties. Two opposing worldviews. And worldview, that is how we look at the world. Do we look at it through human eyes or do we look at it through the word of God? Is that our filter, that everything is judged by the precepts and the principles of God's word, as I think it should be, but it does make a difference what your worldview is. Let me explain. When someone does not believe in God, in the God of the Bible, then who is going to be at the center of everything if there is no God? It's going to be man, right? And uh, so human government would then become man-centered, and uh, we see a lot of that today. If you do not believe in absolute truth, in this Bible, it is absolute, unchanging truth. But if you don't believe that, if you are a relativist in your uh, philosophy that everything is relative to whatever the prevailing thought is, then you are going to look at the laws that are governing our society as being relative, and our constitution and our laws and our values are something that can be changed. And I think we see that in the opposing parties today. If you do not believe that man is the result of the direct and special creation of God and that we are individuals created by God, uniquely and purposely made, then our life and our liberty is going to be secondary to the interests of the state. I mean, it just follows. If It depends on how you view the, the world and how you view how God has ordered the world. Uh, if you accept that, you'll think a certain way. If you reject that, if you reject the God of the Bible, and uh, you may have a form of Christianity, which is usually the religion of the imagination, not grounded in Scripture, then it's going to alter and affect the way that you think personal responsibility would be diminished. If there's no God, we're not answerable to God, then who are we answerable to? Well, it would just be the government. And the government says we're a product of our environment, so let's change the environment. So you can understand that these are important issues, but they are based in our worldview. And so I want to think about some things regarding government tonight. Uh, First of all, just a brief review, because I think most of us are uh, fully aware of this, but a brief review of the divine purpose of human government. Why has God established government? We know that the Bible tells us that God has established three institutions, and each of those has a specific purpose. God, first of all, established the home. The purpose of the home is the preservation of life, and preparation for life. That's where we grow up. That's where we are kept alive and provided for. That belongs to the home. And the father, of course, is the head of the home and he's the leader there. Uh, God established a church or churches. And the purpose of churches is not to raise children in the home. It is to propagate the gospel. There is a separation of responsibilities. And so churches are there to propagate the gospel. The home is there for the preservation and preparation of life. And God established human government for the protection of life and the promotion of good. So I want to give you just three statements concerning the teaching of the Bible regarding government. Number one, understand that government, human government, was initiated by God. Uh, we go back to the book of Genesis, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you some scriptures, but the reference is Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. After the flood, God had destroyed the world and every living thing in the world, save Noah and his family. And uh, after the flood, in order to regulate the sinful actions of man, God said in Genesis 9, 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, 
by man shall his blood be shed. In other words, for the crime, the, the crime of murder, God said that that will be dealt with by other men. They will sit in judgment. They will execute judgment upon the offender. That really is the beginning of what we call human government. And all government powers fall under the great power over life and death that God has given to man to govern himself and to take care of uh, wrongdoers. Number two, government not only was initiated by God, but government is ordained by God, appointed by God. Romans 13, verse 1, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or condemnation, judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, the government, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute, that's that word taxes, pay taxes also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honour to whom honour. Government is ordained by God. First Peter chapter 2 says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Government is ordained of God, so as Christians, we are to be in, subje in subjection to, to submit to, and to pay our taxes to the government. Now, the government is limited, biblically limited, to a twofold role, according to the Word of God. God's intention was, number one, that government would be there for the punishment of evildoers. In fact, Romans 13 uses the word a terror, a revenge. I think I said recently with some of these moves to defund the police or to come up with a different kind of police force that was kinder and, kinder and gentler and didn't uh, use force is so anti-biblical because we are supposed to be afraid of the police if we do wrong. If we do right, we should not be afraid. And uh, the police should treat us that way, but, but if we do wrong, then they ought to be a terror to us. Um, Anyway, we won't get into that too much, but the fact is that the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now, you can argue, and I think you'd have a point, that government is sometimes topsy-turvy. And it seems sometimes today that evildoers get off and those that want to do right, according to the Bible, are the ones that sometimes suffer. But a government is given by God for our protection. And those of you who serve in the military are part of the government and you are fulfilling a God-given role of government to protect us, to protect us in our life, our liberty and the pursuit of happiness and our property. This is the role of government. It's ordained of God. It has a purpose. And then number three, government is limited by God, biblically, because it, has, it is a delegated authority. All uh, the, the higher powers are ordained of God. So a government should exercise the powers that are granted to it by God. It is not God. <laughs> All right? Now some governments in the world behave as if they are God. Thankfully, that's not the case here. But um, government is not God. It is a minister of God. It is a servant it is to serve us, not to subjugate us or to enslave us. Now, government has the right, biblically, to regulate human behaviour. If a man commits murder, the government has a right to 
uh, send law enforcement to arrest, to put on trial, to, uh, to uh, give out the, the punishment and so forth. That's a governmental right. They can regulate human behaviour when it infringes on the rights, life, liberty and property of others. That's what government's for, is to protect us. The relationship of the government to our church is that it protects, it, protects us. Uh, we, you know, we... we uh, we would expect help from the police if we had a problem, which we've had in the past with different issues and so forth. Now, government cannot regulate our thought or our opinions or our beliefs. It should keep its hands off those things. It's not given to a government. In fact, a government's laws should reflect the divine law. You've often heard that our nation is built on the Judeo-Christian ethic. What that means is the law of Moses, not Sharia law or any other law, but the law of Moses, which is biblical. And the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Well, you, you probably recognize some of those words there are, are felonies in our country. It's a felony to commit murder. It's a felony to kidnap someone. It's a felony uh, to be a whoremonger. Uh, to, to be a peddler of pornography and, and so forth, uh, and uh, to be a, 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 perj a perjured person, someone who commits perjury. These are felonies, and our government is there to execute God's law on those areas. But government cannot and must not intrude into those things that are God's. You remember the words of our Lord in Luke 20, verse 25, when they tried to trick him, into either being anti-government or anti-God. And he held up a coin and he looked at the inscription and he said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things which be God's. And there is a limitation of government. There is a division. You say, well, what are the things that are God's that the government should keep its hands off? Let me give you three. Psalm 127 verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. Our children don't belong to the government. The government would love to have our children because right now there's a lot of indoctrination going on, a lot of social engineering. You send your children to a public school, you're likely to bring home some pretty strange books of all kinds of perverted situations, trying to just get that into the children's minds that that's normal behavior. <clears throat> Another, Leviticus 27, verse 30, the tithe is the Lord's. When you put money in the offering plate, that's not the church's money, that's God's money. And uh, it belongs to him. The government, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of politicians would love to take away the deduction for tithing, but that belongs to God. A lower power can't tax the higher power. And the government is not as not above God. Uh, here's another one in Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus said, I will build my church. And uh, a church is to be free from government intervention. Um, the things that are Caesar's belong to them. Our tax money, that's the government's. Our loyalty to the government, that's, that's what they deserve. Our support of the government. Voting is part of, of rendering to Caesar the things that be Caesar's. But there is that uh, distinction there, and the government cannot intrude into the things that are God's. Well, those three things that I mentioned, that uh, the government is, uh, was established by the Lord, it is ordained of God, and it's limited by God, that's about it. The role is based on the biblical fact of man's sinfulness. Because man is wicked and has a heart that will tend toward uh, toward the wrongdoing, we need to have restraint. And so God has established human government for the good order of society, to maintain law and order. 
not to order society, <laughs> but to, uh, to protect us. Government in the Bible, there's no place in the government that, that tells us that it is to provide for its citizens with cradle to grave welfare. That's not found in the Bible. What is found in the Bible is that we as Christians are to take care of one another and we are to do good to all men, especially those that be of the household of faith. Um, and that's God's plan for charity, not for the government to take care of that. That's a spiritual thing. The government is not to manipulate the means of production. The government certainly is not to socially engineer our children. It was Karl Marx who said that man's ills are conditioned by society. That's not a biblical statement. Man's ills are conditioned by the heart. Jesus said out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, and so forth, the works of the flesh. Not from society, but Marx said, well, it's society's problem and greed results from greedy capitalism. So if we abolish capitalism, bring in socialism, then we'll end greed. <laughs> that never happens. There's, there's no place on earth that's gone communist or socialist that's become a utopian society where there is no greed because that doesn't change the heart of man. But worldview produces two distinct forms of government. The Bible says it is better to put confidence or put trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. When you have confidence in man, and certainly the politicians are clamoring now to say, trust me, I'll do this for you. Put your trust in me. The end result of putting confidence in man is socialism. Now, in our nation, socialism usually comes dressed up with appealing promises, such as, we'll give you free education. We'll give you free health care. We'll take care of your retirement and so forth. Well, those things are very appealing. Or they'll dress up socialism with utopian dreams of freedoms, that you can have real freedom. Unfortunately, they mean license to do whatever you want. It's dressed up with godless aspirations, such as we can change the climate. We can control the population and uh, so forth. And yeah, this is a feature of these elections that are coming up. There's a lot of clamoring for socialism today. It's, it's now come out and, and revealed itself in many circles, not everywhere, of course, but loud voices are proclaiming that's what we need, pure socialism. Well, the main tenet of socialism by definition is that it is the controlling of the means of production, the means of distribution and exchange, that it should all be owned and regulated by the state. Give everything to the state and the state will take care of you. In other words, government control. Now, I believe that for decades we've had a creeping socialism in our country. And it's not due to one political party or the other. Both, I think, have allowed it to happen. And once you open the door, it's very hard to take it back. And so politicians usually are not interested in becoming unpopular. And so this socialism goes on. It may not be called that, but uh, it's becoming more and more. And the results of socialism are not good. The idea of redistributing wealth, of taking from those who have to give to those who have not as much. Ultimately, that's going to lead to coercion and confiscation because it's within us as God has created us that if we have worked for something, we want to enjoy the benefits. And if the government says, you have to give it up, we're going to say, no. And the only way they're going to get it is either by punitive taxation or even worse, to confiscate that from you. By the way, that violates the word of God. It violates the right of private ownership which is implied in the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. If you don't own it, how can you steal it? Um, it also produces class envy, which violates the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. 
what your neighbour has. So socialism is not a glorified biblical application to politics. Initiative and hard work are made meaningless. Why should I work? If my money all goes into the government and I get a certain amount back, hey, I'm taken care of. Why should I work by the sweat of my face, as the Bible said was we're supposed to do? Proverbs 12, 11 says, He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. And God intends for man to work. And there's a certain satisfaction that comes from working hard. But the history shows that in countries that have been socialistic or communistic, that uh, productivity is terrible. And ultimately, the system collapses because there's not that initiative there. Socialism replaces Christian charity with government handouts. As I mentioned before, that, that uh, we are, as Christians, to have compassion on those who are suffering and we are the ones who should be doing something about it. But why should we? Hey, the government's got a program for that. And so as Christians, we can be stifled in doing what God has commanded us to do if we're not careful. And one thing that socialism does is it suppresses soul liberty, the right to hold and express opinions, which is a very pr precious liberty, beloved, but if under a socialist regime, uh, you can't think outside of the party line, whatever it is. I mean, we see some countries today as examples, terrible uh, pr repression in those countries. You're only allowed to think a certain way. That is so <laughs> inhuman, I think. Now, people say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible teach a Christian form of communism? And they turn to, and you might want to turn there too, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, this is probably an argument that's put forward for uh, this idea of, uh, sometimes it's called Christian communism. By that they mean that we just don't shoot people if they disagree or won't do what we're telling them. But, uh, not yet. <laughs> but uh, look at verse number 44. Now this is after people have gotten saved. Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost. The other apostles have preached. And uh, 3,000 get saved and then they get baptized and the church grows and they meet every day. And verse number 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Why, that's the very definition of communism, that uh, everybody just pooled their resources. Well, I don't believe so because look over in Acts chapter 5. In verse number four, this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And of course, they'd seen Barnabas, generous Barnabas, sell a piece of land and put that money in the offering plate to be a blessing to others. And they thought, well, everyone was happy about Barnabas doing that. Maybe they'll be happy with us. And so they sold some land. I think uh, in my Bible, it says 100,000 shekels. Pretty good price. And uh, next Sunday they came to church and they dropped it in the offering and they put in 75,000 shekels. And uh, Peter, who was preaching at the time, he said, uh, you only sold that land for 75? Yeah, that's all we sold it for. They kept back part of the price. Notice what Peter says in verse 3 of Acts 5. Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? So even though the church in Jerusalem, out of tr Christian compassion and charity, helped one another, because remember when 3,000 people got saved, 3,000 people probably were out of a job the next, the next day because they were Christians now. There was a lot of poverty and a lot of hardship and people chipped in. But they did it because they wanted to and they didn't have to. It was not enforced. It was voluntary. Right. And here, Ananias, Peter said, look, if you sold it for 100,000 shekels and you only want to give 75, fine. Just don't lie about it. You lied to the Holy Ghost. And uh, 
He said, while it was remained, was it not in thy, the, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own a power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied to men, but unto God. Then over in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, a little bit later on, Peter's in trouble. He's facing execution after the Easter break. And the church goes to prayer. And Peter is miraculously delivered from prison. And verse number 12, and when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So Mary still had a house. She wasn't forced to sell her house for the collective good and distribute it to everybody else. You see, so the Bible does not teach a Christian form of communism. But when you put confidence in man, that's where it's going to lead because there is no God and man is in charge and it's going to lead to the control of society by man himself. Now here in the United States, we are blessed with a form of government that is just amazing. We are a federal republic established to ensure maximum liberty. We are governed by laws that are set forth and expressed in our constitution. Just to illustrate this, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, she, several years ago in Egypt, gave a speech in which she said, I wouldn't use the US Constitution as a guide. The South African one is much better. And she expressed other times a disdain for the US Constitution. Why? Because it was too restrictive on government. You see, our Constitution has less to say about what government can do and a lot more to say what government cannot do. And, and the framers of the Constitution knew that government was a dangerous thing in the hands of lost men. And so the Constitution is written to control government, not to control us. And so there are those on one side who don't have trust in the Lord, but their confidence is in man, and to them the, con the Constitution is a stumbling block. It's an irritation. It's in the way for them to exert control. So we are governed by laws expressed in the Constitution. And we are served, we're not ruled, or we're supposed to be served by democratically elected representatives. And when we trust in the Lord, when our country trusts in the Lord, it produces what we have enjoyed in this country. You know, the framers realized that in human society, some things just needed to be governed. The heart is deceitful above all things. Man is going to sin. Man is going to do things that are wrong. He's going to injure other people and their property and so forth. And the framers realized we have to have government. But only some things needed to be governed. The country could work best through voluntary cooperation. And they realized that the power of a government to require its citizens to do certain things to forbid them from doing certain things and to tax them all under penalty. The government wields power. They can put you in jail. They can fine you. They can do even worse. They can take your life. That the framers of our constitution realized that that had a great potential for abuse. And so in their great wisdom, and I think led by God and guided by God, they produced divided government. Look over, if you will, to Isaiah 33, chapter 33 and verse number 22. Many people believe that the framers of the Constitution, while they were not all necessarily Bible-believing uh, Baptists, but they were men of uh, faith in most cases, and they certainly uh, respected the Word of God. And many believe that this scripture here was the basis for the division of government in our country. The Bible says in verse 22, Isaiah 33, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, and the Lord is our king. He will save us. Now, when you think about that, the Lord is our judge. That's the judiciary. And the Lord is our lawgiver. That's the legislative branch. And the Lord is our king. That's the executive branch. And uh, 
our constitution has been set up with the division of power so that power does not reside in the hands of one branch of government. There's checks and balances. Sometimes they irritate us, but praise God for them. And this is how it has been set up. So what I'm saying simply is this, that your worldview should impact the way that you vote. Considering the party platforms, you say, how do I vote biblically? Well, you know, both parties will tell you we support the Constitution. And both parties, as I've mentioned, are responsible in some measure for the increasing, creeping government control. But you need to read the platforms. Let me read some of the platforms for you. And I'll have some handouts, Lord willing, for next Sunday. Uh, we'll be looking at other issues as well. All right, here is the uh, platform on um, religious liberty. And I'll read uh, the uh, platform for the Democratic Party. Uh, Democrats celebrate America's history of religious pluralism and tolerance. Those are <laughs> kind of interesting words and recognize the countless acts of service of our faith communities as well as the paramount importance of maintaining the separation between church and state enshrined in our constitution. Anyone got a constitution or a bill of rights that says there's a separation of church and state? No. no. Kind of interesting, but that's the democratic platform. The uh, Republicans say we value the right of America's religious leaders to preach, amen, and Americans to f speak freely according to their faith. Republicans believe the federal government, specifically the IRS, is constitutionally prohibited from policing or censoring speech based on religious convictions or beliefs, and therefore we urge the repeal of the Johnson Amendment. All right, so there's a difference. And you have to ask yourself, because I'm not telling you who to vote for, but I'm saying, which of those lines up most with the Word of God? Second Amendment. No one's interested in that. <laughs> the Republican platform says we uphold the right of individuals to keep and bear arms, a natural, inalienable right that predates the Constitution and secure, is secured by the Second Amendment. Lawful gun ownership enables Americans to exercise their God-given right of self-defense for the safety of their homes their loved ones and their communities. And then they, they attack the Democrats in Congress have likewise proposed bills that would limit religious liberty, undermine property rights and eviscerate the Second Amendment. Well, let's read what the Democrats say for themselves, not have the Republicans put words in their mouth. On the Second Amendment, the platform of the Democrat, Democratic Party is we will incentivize states to enact licensing requirements for owning firearms and extreme risk protection order laws that allow courts to temporarily remove guns from the possession of those who are a danger to themselves or others. Brother Spence, I think you're a danger to me. <laughs> yeah, probably am. On the military, since we are somewhat of a military church, the Democratic Party says, we will reverse the Trump administration's hateful transgender ban, discrimination, discriminatory exclusions in the military health care, and policies that stig stigmatize and discriminate against, discriminate against people living with HIV and AIDS, and ensure that the LGBTQ plus service members and families enjoy equal respect, benefits and care. We'll talk about that uh, at a later time. Uh, the Republican platform, the Republican Party is committed to rebuilding the US military into the strongest on earth with vast superiority over other nations or group of nations in the world. We face a dangerous world and we believe in a resurgent America. A little different there. Principled values. The uh, Democratic Party says, Democrats believe that we can only be strong in the world when we are strong and united at home. All right, I agree with that. Uh, we believe that a healthy democracy, just society, an inclusive economy, those are buzzwords for socialism, by the way, um, that they are essential prerequisites for effective American leadership abroad. 
In other words, we've got to be like the rest of the world. And we believe that the ultimate measure and purpose of our foreign policy is whether it protects and advances America's security, property, prosperity, I should say, and values, and delivers results for all Americans. The Republican Party's platform, and uh, these are, I should have given the page numbers, but uh, we reaffirm the Constitution's fundamental principles, limited government, separation of powers, individual liberty, and the rule of law. We support the public display of the Ten Commandments as a reflection of our history and our country's Judean Christian heritage and further affirm the rights of religious students to engage in voluntary prayer at public school events and to have equal access to school facilities. All right, so that's just an example of what I'm saying. If you're a voter, you need to read what the parties put out on, as their platform. What the candidates will tell you will be what they, want, they think you want to hear. It may not be exactly according to their, their platform. And so uh, uh, it's important. Well, let's wind this up because we have a meeting afterwards, but human government will always be imperfect, just like any family, just like any church, but it will be at its best, like any family and any church, when it follows biblical precepts and principles. And as Christians and as Americans, we must participate in our government and in this voting coming up. Ways we can participate, well, first of all, and we do this every Wednesday, I think, is to pray for all who are in authority, whether we agree with them or not. And, um, you know, we, we need to be praying for our president and for his wife, and we need to be praying for uh, the uh, others in the administration and in the Congress who have uh, contracted this virus, I think, whether we agree with them or not, they are God-appointed leaders and uh, we should pray, but we should pray for a righteous outcome. We can ask God for that. One of the difficult things as Christians is we're looking for the coming of Christ. We know that our hope is not here on earth. earth. We're looking for Christ to come, but we also know that before he comes, this world's got to get a lot worse. We don't want to see that happen to our nation, so in a way we're torn. No one wants to see our nation suffer or go down a road that is going to be detrimental. God has blessed this country and in blessing this country has enabled this nation to be the greatest giver and sender of evangelists and missionaries and preaching the gospel around the world. And I know the devil would like to take that away. So we need to pray. We need to, as I said, know the choices, understand by educating ourselves, read the party platforms and then participate by voting. And I would encourage you, if you are a resident here or if you're a resident elsewhere, you still have time probably to register to vote and to make your vote count. But make it count for Christ. And uh, for some that may be, well, I've always voted this way and now that I'm a Christian, I need to think about some things. Yes, you do. But uh, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, but certainly I can tell you what the Bible says on the issues. So Lord willing, next uh, Sunday night, I think I'm preaching then, I'll talk about some other issues that are very, very important in this election.